So hi everyone, welcome to this lecture. Uh, my lecture title today is Virtual Orthodontic Care Paradigm Shift. I thank Smart Aligner Services for inviting me tonight. And uh, it is my night time. I know it's your lunch time. So uh, hello from Sydney, uh, all the way to Spain. And I know some of the doctors are um, in different areas. So I see this is a group here. Feel free to chat and say hello or ask your questions. Every now and then I will make a pause in my lecture to look at any questions and answer them. Um, also guys, if you have a, QR, a phone, you can just quickly go and scan this QR code. This lecture has a handout and all my publications that are related to this lecture are also available with that QR code. You can download them. So I'll just give you like 30 seconds to a minute to just take a photo with that QR code. Um, you can also type qrcode.de forward slash pubs and also reach through the URL. So hello everyone again. Uh, make sure um, you're able to download. Um, I see some people, Arash, Sank, Damari, Daniel, Margarita, Mark, um, Mazen, Renata, Smart Alana Services, uh, Stadis, Tala, and Yogo. Welcome. Okay. So again, has everyone, can somebody just do a little reaction or emoji or hello to tell me you've taken photo here of the QR code so I can move on? I will bring this slide up again at the end, actually. Yes. I think you should be able to... Um, do a hand gesture or something like that if you want. Okay, so just a quick thing about me. I've done um, a lot of my studies in Australia. So I did my Bachelor of Dentistry 2001, nearly over 20 years ago. I've been a dentist. Uh, then I've done a Master's of Science in Clinical Epidemiology, which involved all, everything about clinical research. Um, then I became an orthodontist in 2013. And uh, that was from University of Adelaide. I've also gone to Dusseldorf in Germany and done quite a lot of research with Benedict Wilmers during my postgrad. And I um, completed a master's of business administration three or four years ago. So as you can see, I love doing degrees. I'm collecting them. Um, I've also been to Stanford University where I just learned some amazing stuff. If anybody wants to do innovative stuff, learn about um, something called design thinking, it is really fantastic. Some of the top ideas in the world come out of this boot camp. So I did it. It's a four day boot camp. It was just unbelievable to be there. So if you ever get the opportunity to go to Stanford, it's, you know, I really recommend it. Um, also, you know, why I'm doing this lecture, I really learned, I, I love teaching. I believe whatever you learn, you need to give, you need to empower other people. You see a photo of me there teaching my little brother when I was only little, and I'm teaching him all the different vegetables out there. Um, and then I also want to, you know, uh, thank my mom and my little dog there who are always uh, my champions. So let's get to the lecture. So what I want to talk about today, my lecture, Virtual Orthodontics, a paradigm shift. What I really want to talk about is the difference between digital orthodontics and virtual orthodontic care. To me, digital orthodontics is any customized appliance that's planned digitally or fabricated digitally. So we're looking at like your digital braces, your fixed appliances, your um, uh, digital, uh, you know, your clear aligners. But virtual orthodontic care is the next step. So to me, I don't just practice digital orthodontics. I practice digital and virtual orthodontics. And I really believe this is the new way of doing things. So the app that I use is called Dental Monitoring. But I know nowadays you have Invisalign, you have other apps that also allow virtual orthodontic care. So what they do, some of them come with artificial intelligence, some don't. So some of them are just helping you monitor treatments, you know, give you an overview of what's going on um, from diagnosis to retention. So you can use them in variety of uh, treatments, uh, treatment stages. But also um, the ones with the artificial intelligence are very useful. And I'll go over that with you. 
So this is even a, a, even our mixed dentition cases. So we've got an Invisalign mixed dentition case here. And you can see how he's got the cheek retractors. He's, you know, maybe 10 years old. And he's doing his own video scan with his phone to upload to the dental monitoring app. Now, this video, if you see the retractors, they have these calibrated green dots, and that's how they measure distances. So from this one video scan, which is taken with aligners and without aligners, I can see how treatment's going. So let's talk about why do I believe in digital orthodontics combining with virtual orthodontic care? Why it's so important? So let me tell you a bit of history. I started intraoral scanning. I mean, it was ages ago, 2015. Back then, uh, we didn't have laboratories that accepted STL files. We didn't even, I mean, scanners were so new. So I had just purchased the first iTero scanner, the really big one, 2015. And from day one, I went digital when I started my own practice. And I did not look back. I, I wasn't very confident with teen aligners until a year later when I started my first teen aligner case. And I will show you my very first teen aligner case in a sec, which was done without virtual orthodontic monitoring. And then I'm gonna show you cases done with it to show you the difference. So I've been doing that for a while. So this is my very first teen aligner case I completed with just Invisalign teen. There was no virtual monitoring app back then. We simply just gave him uh, aligners and class two elastics and we were able to give him a nice finish. This treatment took about two, two and a half years. I think maybe a little bit longer. Um, and then I started using dental monitoring in 2016. What dental monitoring did was turned my patient's smartphone, Android or iPhone, into a remote scanning device. And I mean, we're talking 2016 when there was no videos, there was no superimposition, there was no 3D tracking. We started back then. Even back then I was so impressed with it that, I mean, now what it is is very, very good. It's very sophisticated. It has a video mode. It's very easy to do. But back then as well, it, I saw the benefit because what I loved was that I can see my patient stages, where they're at in between appointments. And all of this is happening pre-pandemic. So you can understand we were very progressive. I think um, perhaps in on the East Coast of Australia, I'm from Sydney, Australia, which is the East Coast. Um, I was perhaps the first orthodontist to even put a patient on dental monitoring. So I was, I love technology. So I really wanted to use it. Um, and then when dental monitoring came to my office, I started my very first teen aligner case with not just Invisalign teen, but also dental monitoring, virtual orthodontic care. So the patient was taking weekly scans as they're changing aligners with their, um, with their iPhone and uploading it. And we were then analyzing that to see how the treatment was going. So I'm gonna show you this case as well. And, and not only you will learn uh, the technology aspect, you will also learn with this presentation, all the different tools and tips of ClinCheck design. Today, or since the pandemic, we started to use something called SmileMate. And what we do with SmileMate is now, when a patient just has to send us a small photo like this and submit it online, and just from that photo, within seconds, we can now send the patient a simulation of what their teeth can look like when they're straight. So this is really, really impactful to just send a patient a video of what they can expect if we were to do treatment. This is all being generated with artificial intelligence um, and really, literally within seconds. So it's, it's really nice for the patient to see what the plan is. The AI generated this smile without me giving any input. So I didn't tell them to do crown lengthening. I did not tell them to change the shapes of the teeth. The AI just generated what it thought looked great for the patient's smile. So it's a great tool for patients to see and visualize the end from just a photo uploaded to your website, even before they come through your door. Another thing SmileMate does is simulates different appliances for the patient. So 
again, just from that initial photo, without even coming to your office, this patient can be sent the video that's generated by AI with different appliances to show them how they will look. So uh, again, this is amazing technology, which we should be using to, to help our patients come to the right decision on which appliance to choose. So in this case, uh, you can choose uh, attachments with the liners, um, uh, clear brackets, metal brackets, self-ligating, uh, twin brackets, and SmileMate will send that simulation to the patient that if you did treatment, this is what it would look like during and after. So I just love using technology because it has helped me a lot communicate with my patients. I also believe artificial intelligence is just another pair of eyes. It's like getting a second opinion service. So for me, I'm not afraid of artificial intelligence as long as we can control it as the doctor and we we'll use it to just help our decisions rather than drive our decisions. So for me, it's an extra pair of eyes and I prefer to have that during treatments. I was really impressed by all the results I was getting, the patient satisfaction, the doctor satisfaction, my team satisfaction, that I wanted to write a book about it for my patients. I wanted to just in simple language explain to my patients why I love aligners, why I love virtual monitoring and what are the benefits for them. So I wrote this book, which is, it's not designed for dental professionals, but the book is in uh, layman language, more plain English, to explain to my patients why aligners are amazing. So again, you can go read this online. This is an ebook. And if you want to scan that QR code, you can actually, um, you know, have a read of it if you have time. Uh, and, you know, and then I printed this book and I did an ebook as well. So I called it love is all you need and a good orthodontist. So what are we going to discuss today? So let's look at our journey. We will talk about some evidence. We will show a lot of cases. And then I'm going to leave you with just a very short section of how to get started. What are the next steps? So let's talk about some evidence. I will try to go through this a little bit faster. We know technology is rising from that 1990 Nokia phone that I had, my first phone, to my phone on my watch now. You know, we know how things are changing. We are entering into the fourth revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, which is now driven by so much digital data in the cloud that is constantly being analyzed. And artificial intelligence is being so generative now with that data that it's helping us make decisions faster. This is like so much data in the cloud. So the more digital data we create, um, in fact, uh, a, what AI has done is helped organize that data and create themes from it. So I really do like AI. One of the simplest example is Siri or Google Assistant, where they, you know, when you're, it's time to leave for an appointment, Google can give you a little click, hey, traffic time is heavy or you need to leave now. It's simply assisting someone's life. And that's why I love AI. For me, I like looking at progress of my patient. This is a typical dental monitoring, virtual tracking patient with the liners where we're looking at, you know, from 23rd July on the top, you can see 23rd July, top left and the top right, 17th October, 2023. So over those couple of years, you can see the changes that the patients had in multiple views. And you can see dental monitoring giving me certain alerts down the bottom. Uh, so right down the bottom, it's telling me the satisfactory aligner tracking and what time point. And the other time point on the right side is showing me there's a noticeable unseat. So as a doctor, I have certain parameters and I tell dental monitoring what to tell my patients. So I have protocols and systems inside the app. So if, in, for example, if there's a noticeable unseat, tell patient not to change aligners. So my patient's submitting this every week and we're monitoring their progress. The other things we're looking at is things like midline changes, overjet, overbite, gingival health, tooth color. So we're looking at almost a hundred different clinical conditions 
while we're looking at these scans. And of course, I'm not looking at everything. The AI in the background is also helping me get alerted to anything that is unusual. I've written a lot of articles, guys. So if you scan this, again, um, a lot of my publications and the handout of this lecture is in um, this QR code. You can also do QR code.de forward slash pubs. Um, you can go download these papers I've written and also the handout. So these are a couple of um, studies that I published as well. Uh, Professor Nikolaj Ved is fantastic. He's uh, been a supervisor, a couple of the studies here. Um, and I also am writing a book now. On the right, you're seeing the cover of a book I'm writing. It's called The Clinical Handbook of Digital Orthodontics. Clinical meaning it's going to be full of cases and clinical tips and um, a lot of system management. You know, as orthodontists, it's not just about doing fantastic treatments. It's about communication with the patient, keeping that patient motivated during treatment and creating systems and protocols to have not just excellent outcomes, but efficient outcomes, timely outcomes. So... This book will have a lot of workflow systems, processes that I've developed over the last 10 years and everything that I kind of developed, I want to put this in this book. So it's in the works and uh, uh, it will be coming out next year. So keep an eye out for it. Um, I've also recently published a paper called Virtual First. So which means I start my my patient's very first contact with virtual consultation. So in this paper, I describe, which is published in Seminar in Orthodontics, and you can download it from that QR code. In this paper, I describe my virtual orthodontic workflow. When a patient contacts us, they are taken to the virtual website, they upload their photographs, they are given a lot of information before they even come into an appointment and how that's helped me filter out the patients who are motivated from those who are not, the patients who are willing to start treatment um, versus those that don't. So I, I love this kind of stuff. To be honest, it's made my workflow very efficient um, and um, saved me a whole lot of time. Also, using these technologies, I'm able to really educate my patients as well, very clearly. Guys, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So on the right, you see a QR code. Our YouTube channel is at Boss Ortho, um, B-O-S-S-O-R-T-H-O. -S -S and it's got a lot of cases in it and lectures in it and clinical tips. So it's a whole lot of random uh, videos. I think we got about 70 to 80 videos full of information. So if you are interested in some of them, just go to the YouTube channel. On the very first. And... Um, uh, there we go. So it's at Boss Ortho. Now let's go to why I believe aligners are the thing. So Andrew's six keys to normal occlusion, he gave us the pre-adjusted edgewise appliance. Well, Andrew's concepts or this appliance, the edgewise appliance, which is or straight wire appliance, is, is based on two principles. One of them is that there's ideal, it's an ideal orthodontic appliance. So there is no slop, there is no um, um, loss, anchorage loss in the system. It's also based on the concept there's ideal force delivery. And we know that not, that's actually quite dubious. We know when the same amount of force is applied to similar situations, it can have varying results. There's a large variation. So when we convert orthodontics to simple theories of forces and moments, they generally do not apply to clinical level because there's a huge variation. You can look at a mixed dentition to a teenager, to an adult, to an older adult, and you will already notice this variation. The speed of tooth movement can vary, uh, uh, you know, quite a lot because the straight wire appliance is one size fits all. And we know that not to be true. We know one size does not fit all. In my opinion, is the silliest thing I've heard. 
Okay, just put straight wire, put, you know, a straight wire is typically is actually the worst appliance, in my opinion. It's actually very difficult appliance, to be honest, to get really good finishing. So I, I prefer aligners and I prefer aligners with virtual tracking. Now, this is a Australian study by an Australian orthodontist who works uh, uh, very similar to the way I work. And um, uh, Dr. Steve Saman on the Gold Coast in Australia. And he published this paper that showed patients in Australia really prefer um, virtual tracking, remote tracking during aligner therapy. They find that the, uh, that the fact that we use remote monitoring more convenient and the fact that there's reduced number of appointments is also quite convenient. So for me, I use virtual tracking and aligners because I can avoid risks of disputes and complaints. Everything's digital, it's very pre-planned. Well, my patients feel that there's better communication with the orthodontist because I'm using a lot of virtual tracking week by week and I'm able to have a virtual office. So instead of working five days a week in my clinical office, I can still run a full-time practice by working at least three days a week virtually. And that is great for me because we often don't think about us because research shows that the happiest people use their money to buy time. So by paying for this technology, by using this technology, I've bought back time for myself. And I, and I find that that is extremely important to me. I like to go to work knowing what's happening with each and every one of my patients. I like to know exactly their status before they walk in through the door. And it helps me run a very, very slick, smooth, efficient practice. So I, I, I would urge you, to even use these type of technologies to build your practice or business, to have a leading edge, to you know be different from your um, your peers, because populations changing. We know now millennials and I generation are comprising a big part of our population growth, and hence they are they are tech savvy. You know our generations tech savvy. We even have. Um, I generation puppies, you know, on iPads. This is a really funny video. <laughs> Let's keep going because this is just highlighting the fact that technology is taking over everything. You know, wireless is the new black. We have a lot of I generation, Y generation that are so used to mobile savviness. This is no longer an issue for them. They can easily, all my teenagers, mixed dentitians, and even adults can take these videos on their iPhones and upload them every week um, so I can get an estimate. It's also really motivating because when they upload these videos, they can see the changes in their own mouth and their teeth. These videos are being updated for the patient. So it also helps to improve motivation and compliance. So we've had many advances in orthodontics in the last 10 years, 3D imaging, biomodulation, smart and customized appliances. And I will talk about that, TADs are included in that. But the AI automations is so new and emerging. Um, and I think we actually are there very much. I mean, when I started AI and automations 2016, we didn't have very good systems. Now we have so much data. You know, we also have so many um, smart appliances, but the problem is a lot of papers find that they're as good as conventional. When you look at show small versus conventional, a lot of papers find the same thing. And if they do find that the smart appliance is better than conventional, often look at the author, you know, generally the author is the inventor. Insignia is fantastic product. I know they're changing Insignia now. Um, it's 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 one of my favorite product to go to for fixed appliances. But um, again, paper after paper finds no difference when you compare Insignia, your digital customized uh, fixed appliances, with, for example, conventional Damon brackets directly bonded. Really, there's no difference in many areas. So time and time again, we're getting the same thing. There's no difference in different types of braces. There's no magic braces. So in my opinion, customized orthodontics with clear aligner trumps. And um, 
One of the reasons is the demand has increased for clear aligners. We have patients walking in and wanting this. For the first time, many adults who've been wanting treatment and never did it are now coming into our offices and wanting to have straight teeth again. We know from studies that patients prefer this. We, in this study, it was found that orthodontic appliances, which are here alternative appliances, they were the most attractive for a patient uh, when compared to ceramic brackets, stainless steel ligating, and standard twin brackets. We also know aligners do a good job. We know from accuracy studies, um, you know, what, what works well, what doesn't. We know, for example, uh, incisor root talk is not very accurate. We get 42% accuracy on a clean check. Uh, premolar derotation is the least accuracy. Upper molar distalization up to four millimeters has very high level of accuracy and extrusion is about 60%. So we know from a lot of studies now um, how plastic distorts, how it exerts forces and how we can compensate. So from these studies, we know what to expect and how we can compensate to get better results. Mind you, a lot of the accuracy studies are in adults, they're not in children. So when you, those who do teen treatments with aligners will know a lot of the treatments work and the accuracy is higher. So we don't have this data, but from experience, I can tell you that what we see in the accuracy papers for aligners is not the same in children. So clear aligner treatment trumps, in my opinion, there's the high demand, patients like it, patients prefer it. Um, but here's the problem. It's not proactive or dynamic. Now, what I mean by that, it doesn't adapt to biological variation. What I mean by that is if we are to give every patient a liner and say, here, change them seven days, change them 10 days, every aligner change 14 days. We are letting them go with the flow. We do not know, we do not have control. We do not know if that tooth movement is so complex that perhaps for a couple of aligners, we should tell them to do every three week change. Sometimes the tooth movement because a perio needs to be really slow. Uh, or sometimes we, uh, in children, for example, you can go five day changes because the liners are cracking. You know, they're cracking a lot as teeth are moving really fast. So how do I create this biologic variation? Because biologic variation and speed of tooth movement doesn't come from the appliance. There's no magic bracket. There's no magic plastic. It comes from the patient's osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. So at the end, it's about patient's biology, which we don't know because there's a huge variation. Like we don't know who's going to get root resorption. We, we can't predict who's going to have a faster tooth movement and a more optimal tooth movement. Hence, to be efficient and to be able to increase predictability of the aligner, if you combine an aligner with virtual orthodontic care, it will help you adapt aligner by aligner to patient's biologic variation. So the patient's not allowed to change an aligner until it fits perfectly. Hence, you are able to adapt to the complexity of the tooth movement, to patient's compliance. If they're not wearing the aligners a lot, they, it's, it's not going to track. And if it doesn't track well, the dental monitoring will detect it and tell it not tell the patient not to change. Uh, perhaps certain aligners or at certain phases of treatment, we need to slow down tooth movement to increase predictability. So dental monitoring or virtual orthodontic care allows us to do that. It also allows me to do many other things. I'm able to semi-automate a lot of my responses based on certain uh, workflows that you can create in the app. I can troubleshoot early if I have to do an early case refinement, possibly do less case refinements as well. Re definitely reduce chair time. Every paper shows that clinical chair time is reduced by 35 to 40% when you use monitoring with aligner compared to aligner only. And I think it's very important when we had pandemic and for two years, you know, Australia had the longest lockdowns you know, patients weren't able to go around to offices and 
it, it, it was really, really handy back then. And perhaps reduce litigations as well, because you're seeing everything in real time, week by week. Um, so this is the paper by Dr. Siman that showed that using dental monitoring and aligners, the number of appointments were reduced um, by 35, 40%, the clinical appointments, the number of refinements were slightly reduced and the treatment time was a bit less when they used it. Now we did a similar study in my office. So this is again, another Australian study. And this study was part of a poster at the AAO and it's been now published in the AJODO. We designed similar study to Dr. Steve Saman, but we used clinical outcomes, not just a survey. So Dr. Saman looked at survey and um, we looked at a little bit more. So we looked at dental monitoring, virtual monitoring with aligners versus control. And again, we found the same thing that our number of refinements were a little bit lower, but the number of appointments was about 30% less. So we had a nice reduction in clinical appointments, but getting the same result. So um, it, it, it hands down, it does save clinical appointment. Study after study shows that. My treatment time was reduced slightly, but it wasn't statistically significant. The appointments were definitely reduced and that was statistically significant. Now there is a, something called compliance that I measured and I measured compliance with a survey to my patients asking them and also looking at how often they scanned. And I found that when they did dental monitoring, they were wearing their aligners more, they were more compliant and we were finishing treatments in a timely manner. So as opposed to the others. When I look at case refinements, we did reduce our case refinements slightly as well. So a slight reduction in doing the number of refinements. So all of this is very, very beneficial. What would be nice for the next study to do is to look at, can I reduce aligners per treatment? So I don't know, maybe, maybe not. We don't know that. So with virtual orthodontic mo monitoring, it's a new paradigm. It's a new shift. I can look at tracking failures. I can look at improved finishing, uh, you know, with the patient in their house and, and I'm on my computer. I can look at non-compliance. I can look at treatment plan changes and it's a great doctor experience for me. So let's look at some examples. So this is somebody who had a rapid maxillary expander and we put this kid on, he's a, he's a mixed dentition uh, case. And we put this child on dental monitoring. And you can see from here that we were able to look at the diastema opening. We can see the cross bites corrected. And then a few months later, six months later, we can see the diastemas closed. And this patient only had total three appointments. So one was the consultation. One was the cementation of the RME, uh, the maxillary expander. And then we had the finish at six months later. But throughout the treatment, he was being monitored with dental monitoring. So they take different views, you know, with mouth open, mouth closed. And it really takes the patient two to five minutes to do it. I was also able to track this child for how much their teeth were moving. So I could see that this particular tooth had moved. If you look down the bottom, how much it had moved distally, how much so we're looking at the molar. So to look at buccal expansion, right? Look at the buccal expansion. The molar had moved 2.01 millimeter buccally. It had extruded and it had also moved a little bit distally. I could look at this just from scans without the patient coming in, no study model analysis. This was generated from the, uh, from the app itself for me. So when we look at the other side, we can see again, how did the cross bite correct? We can see the two six move buccally by 2.11 mil, it extruded by 1.22 mil and it moved measly by 0.22 mil. So we can kind of get some idea of how this happened. The doctor experience is also another thing, right? So for example, this is a patient of mine that's doing dental monitoring. Each dot is when they upload their photographs, certain time points. So generally patients do it every seven days in my office. Um, and when they do every seven days, we are looking at tracking. 
And you can see the green lights means everything was tracking well. So patient was asked to change their aligner. But when it's red lights, we are, we are not letting them change. We are telling them there is an unseat, there's a tracking issue, do not change. So the patient stays in the same aligner until it fits almost as good as possible. But looking at these scans, I was able to see that one of the tooth wasn't tracking. So the two, three wasn't tracking. And if you really understand why it wasn't tracking, it didn't have an attachment on it and we were moving it distally. So you can troubleshoot these errors early. You can bring the patient back, do an early refinement and be able to correct it. You know, so it picks up all these things. So now let's look at cases. Um, guys, before I go to cases, the next part of my presentation is all about cases. I will just pause for a sec with your questions. So status is asking, why do you think you can reduce treatment time with aligners? Does biology of the bone changes? No, I don't believe we can change treatment time. Uh, I don't believe it's reduced treatment time with aligners. I believe it's reduced treatment time when you compare aligners alone and aligners and virtual tracking. Because aligners and virtual tracking combined increase the efficiency of the system. The patient doesn't move into the next aligner until the current aligner tracks. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I also feel the compliance has increased. So I don't believe that aligners are faster than braces. Although a couple of retrospective studies have shown that, that in mild to moderate cases, aligners, uh, aligner patients finish about three to five months faster than braces patients, but only for mild to moderate cases. So we, uh, but in extraction cases, the studies show that there was about an additional six to nine months of treatment time when you use aligners versus fixed appliances. So in extraction cases, I tell my patients, aligners are known to be longer than fixed appliances. So sometimes we do hybrid. Um, okay, so let's look at the very first aligner case that I treated, class two, div two, deep bite, no dental monitoring, no virtual tracking. He was an older teen, 15 year old. Um, he came to me because, 2015, we're talking 2016, right? Ages ago. Nobody was doing aligners for him. He was very self-conscious. He didn't want to have braces. He didn't want to be bullied at school. You know, I think Australia is a little bit different where the kids have just got a, 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 a you know, a, a little bit more. I don't know. I think nowadays the generations are different. You know, they just, uh, maybe it's social media. You know, they're on social media. They don't want braces. They don't want to be bullied because they have braces. So this kid, for since the age of 12, was looking for an orthodontist who would do aligners for him. And back in 2016, many of them refused. They said, no, you can't be done with aligners. You can only be done with braces. Today, we know that that's not true. We can easily treat this kid with aligners. So he's already 15 years old. By the time I started treatment, maybe 15 and a half, 16 We've got class two, uh, you know, brachyfacial, uh, mandibular retrognathia, traumatic deep bite, peg laterals, um, you know, a, lo a lot of the features. So we've got a diastema there as well. And we've got increased curve of spin, the lower arch. Um, so let's just look at that's his initial presentation. So I do my first clean check. We build in a lot of intrusion of the upper and lower incisors to correct. Uh, the deep bite, uh, we do some asymmetric, slightly asymmetric IPR to help with the midlines. And uh, you can also see we are, um, we are kind of, uh, these are my different refinements that I did for the patient. You can see the very first on the left, then mid course correction, and then the final. You can see the final refinement that I'm doing there. So progressively, you see the deep bite changing. You see a great overbite control, um, a nice class two finishing into a class one. So we go from here for a 15 and a half year old to there and finally to here. And I was very happy with this result because back then he was told he cannot have aligners by multiple orthodontists and he waited so long to get treatment. He was 26 months in treatment, I think a little bit long. Uh, back then we didn't use dental monitoring. So um, I think it's a little bit long. Uh, you know, I also want to be efficient. 
But you can see what we did here. We had buttons on the lower teeth and hooks on the upper canines. And we just ran class to elastic, uh, deep bite correction. We know the mandibular retrognathia cannot be fixed without surgery. He didn't want surgery. So we got a nice dental and occlusal result for him. Um, and this is him 12 months in retention. He does have peg lateral, so you have a little bit of space on the distal of the one, two. But post-treatment, 12 month of retention, look at the massive growth of his jaw. So this, this kid's now 17 years old here, then he's 18. And you can see how much his chin has developed. And, you know, he just overall, the brachyfacial is going. So I love looking at growth in children, in teenagers, you know, how they change. And sometimes we intervene a bit too much. I, I, And, you know, you look at him in another five years, he's going to have more chin development. And I think he's going to look good. And I think not doing surgery is the right thing for him. We can see the changes in his lower jaw. But the changes weren't because of my treatment, because I didn't do any orthopedics. All I did was dental changes. So a lot of the, the change in his jaw growth, the lower jaw growth came from his own growth and perhaps some vertical development of his um, lower posteriors <clears throat> and, and ramal growth. So, you know, I love looking at growth. I love this is over two years or two and a half years. You know, how his chin and profile change on its own without much intervention. So we go from initial to retention and that deep bite's holding quite nicely. It's looking good. Um, you can see how the gingivas also change. You know, the contours of the gingivas change. Uh, initially, we thought he might need crown lengthening, but he didn't. Anyways, then I do my second teen. This is a teen who came to me and um, he had, was much more severe. He was 12 years old. He's younger, but severe dental crowding and class two div two malocclusion. And we finished him in 16 months. I want to show you this case. So the uh, by the way, his profile is retrognathic. He was straining his lip in the profile, making him look class three, but he's actually class two. So we've got your typical class two div two, severe overbite, uh, uneven gingival heights, and um, you know, almost inflamed gingiva. That's his cephalometrics there on the left. You can see he's a nice class two, a lot of overjet there. And then you can see his OPG. Um, this is his very first clean check. We are looking at doing some upper arch on mass distalization plus a little bit of elastic simulation. So to be honest, in children, whether you do upper arch on mass distalization, so all together, or whether you do lower arch um, mesialization, it doesn't matter because they're still growing. The class two effect is still working. So if you look at, uh, let's go to his first clean check too. We're building intrusion into the system. Anteriors are intruding. And while we're intruding his anteriors, we're extruding the posteriors because he's still growing and we've got the potential to grow um, and, and really extrude those lower posteriors, right? I'll extrude them two, three millimeters over a year. And uh, minimal attachments here, but a lot of attachments for those lower posteriors to really extrude them. And while we're doing it, we're doing class two elastics to correct the class two. The effect it's going to have is a bit of upper arch distalization, a bit of lower jaw growth, um, and lower arch mesialization. So this is the kid six months in treatment. He was very compliant. He was on dental monitoring. And you can see within six months in treatment, we're almost class one molar and canine and overbites corrected. If any of your orthodontists remember Beck philosophy, Beck talked about correcting the overbite first. He talked about vertical first. And Beck always said, if you correct the overbite, the vertical first, the sagittal will take care of itself. And that's why I love aligners, because if I get that vertical love right, the sagittal just goes boom. It just works really well. Perhaps because of disclusion effect of the aligners, I don't know. But it's almost like I'm using a beg appliance here because beg appliance is very good at overbite control. 
compared to your street wire appliance where you correct your vertical at the end. To me, that doesn't make sense. I don't like correcting vertical at the end. I don't like just to level and align and then do vertical and AP corrections at the end. So I prefer to do the hardest part first and then worry about finishing. So vertical control is really important to me. And a lot of my team cases within six to nine months, overbite, overjet corrected. That's how I work with them. So this is him, 11 months in treatment. And uh, you can see nicely, everything is lining up really well. His small aesthetics look good. This is showing the amount of extrusion. So the heavy red contacts on the posterior teeth, we really extruded his lower posteriors and we intruded anteriors. So, and you can see a bit of arch expansion, not too much. So blue is where the teeth were, white is um, the post-treatment. And, and, and the biggest thing is the occlusal setup. So vertical is really important. And we know that um, clean checks tend to be not as accurate when it comes to extrusion, especially a posterior teeth. On average, we know we need to compensate for extrusion. But I believe in children, that's not the case. I've done a lot of children. We don't have studies of accuracy in children. I've done a lot of teen cases where I find that if I build two millimeter of extrusion, I'll pretty much get 90, 95% of it. I will get majority of it. So I don't tend to overcorrect in children and teens. So this is his OPG at the end. You can see nice roots parallelism and obviously has to have his eights removed. Dental monitoring is showing me how rapidly his teeth were moving. On average, his teeth were moving about two and a half millimeter per month. Um, it's also showing me how did we correct the class two? So if we look at um, uh, the tooth one three, which is his upper canine, we can see it distalized by 1.86 millimeters. So we know that we were able to distalize that canine into the class one. So I'm able to look at these measurements without taking a CEPH, without bringing the patient in, all from a virtual app. Um, by the way, uh, I must declare, I have no interest or conflict of interest with dental monitoring. I'm simply their user. Um, I have no conflict of interest with Invisalign. Uh, I'm not an opinion leader for any company in orthodontics. Um, and I basically speak from my experience and I speak from um, what I learn and what I want to teach and, and share. So what I loved about DM was all this monitoring was giving me so much data, so much data and so much uh, preparation for my patients. As the patient is walking through the door, I'm telling him, Oh, wow. I know you're finished today. I can see you're finished today. Let's just get you retainers now. Okay. So those are a couple of teen cases, right? We know teens are easy. By the way, I've written another paper here, seminars. Um, all these papers are in um, that code that I've given you. This is an open bite case. Now, what you've noticed so far, I haven't used TADS. I will be honest, in the last two years, I've hardly used TADS. I don't, I'm not a big fan of mini screws. I think they're overused in orthodontics. I think a lot of times we can get away with them, without them. And um, we tend to just tad attack everybody. So let's look at this. I mean, tads are useful, but not in this case. This is an open bite case with um, Biomax protrusion, Asian patient. She didn't want surgery. She's got gingival display on smiling, but she doesn't want surgery. And we told her, if we treat you, your gingival display on smiling will increase. And she was aware and she was okay to go ahead with that. So we decided to do four premolar extraction here. And we decided to do aligners with virtual tracking, and also retracting incisors. So majority of our anchorage was retraction of incisors, maybe 60, 70% retraction of incisors. And the other was posterior mesialization. And that would give us the overbite control. So this is her OPG, which you can see she has impacted eights. Um, and we decided to get rid of the fives. More than showing you from the front, I wanna show you from the side. This is the clean check. We removed the fives at the start. 
And then we're basically doing anterior retraction. Now, aligners are very good at anterior retraction. Your Bimax protrusive cases, you do not need tags. They just go boom. If you worn aligners yourself, if you did aligner treatment yourself, you'll feel that. When I did aligners, I could feel them pushing my upper incisors back when I didn't put any movement in my upper incisors or any expansion. So there's this collective plastic force that pushes incisors back. So we decided to use horizontal elastics in each arch to help retract them. And you can see here, this is five months in treatment. What I really want to highlight to you here is how the teeth are moving bodily. You can see the upper fours and the lower fours, the first premolars are retracting bodily with no loss of anchorage, no tipping, no side effects. So we're starting to really get a nice bodily control here and retract them. Now, can you get that? Yes, you can. But what really helped in this case was dental monitoring. Because again, if you look at her red and green lights, Let's look at her in May. She had a green light. Then she had a red light and a green light. Then red, 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 red. Yeah, so you see some aligners, the teeth weren't tracking. And in extraction cases, it's very important that the aligner does not distort. If the aligner distorts, you can really lose anchorage and get like 45 degree tipping. And then you, can, you have no way of correcting it with aligners, only with fixed appliances sometimes. So in these extraction cases, I find virtual tracking really important because certain movements, I will slow down the changes, certain move, and dental monitoring is doing it for you, but you can override it. It's a, it's a semi-automated system. So what you're seeing here is how we're beautifully walking the teeth without any tipping. So we, we use good anchorage principles. We're using the root surface area anchorage principle where we're taking a tooth at a time we didn't retract the whole arch. We're using virtual tracking. So we're not letting the patient change aligners every seven days, where some aligners are seven days, some aligners 14 days, some aligner 21 days, some aligner 10 days, but we're doing it aligner by aligner, okay? Until the aligner fits, they're not gonna move forward into the next aligner. We are visualizing everything. Patient can travel, patient can go wherever they want, and you know we can monitor them from anywhere in the world. This patient in the middle of a treatment moved to the UK and we were then treating her between Australia and UK. She would fly to Australia once a year and then go back to UK. We were actually dealing with it between Australia and UK. Um, and I finished her treatment. She flew to Australia just for her final uh, finish. So you know it's showing me. So again, I see in this picture, there's no tracking. Patient was coming to Australia. We do a refinement. We, we add a new attachment on that canine and, and control, get the good control that we want. So this, sorry, I think I just went back. So this is 13 months progress. Again, we showed you six, five month progress. This is 13 months progress. 13 months, you can see again how those upper and lower premolars have retracted. The space is almost closed and now we're ready for anterior retraction. So once the posteriors have retracted, I start doing my on mass anterior retraction. So you'll see here, we start, we're now at this level, the patient sends us this from UK and I can see she's almost ready for um, finishing her treatment. She comes in to have a finish. And here we are, we've actually um, taken off all her attachments on this day. Her gingival display on smiling probably increased, but she's not uh, lifting a lip up, but it's symmetric. I find gingival display on smiling is not an issue if it's symmetric. Beauty is symmetry. So if we create symmetry, often patients accept that. So here we have a, a, a nice result. And uh, we between UK and Australia, we were able to do this with remote monitoring at all times. So we've got initial photos, final photos, and now we have it on retention monitoring. So we actually keep an eye every month on the stability of a result uh, via dental monitoring. So instead of doing my six month, three month retainer checks, I do virtual every month. So every month retainer checks. This is her post-treatment OPG and CEF. 
showing the uh, closure. Now, obviously, she'll always have a bit of lip competency, incompetency, but these are patients who don't want surgery. Now, what we didn't use is TADS here. I don't think TADS were uh, valid here. Um, and I've closed the most massive open bites. I'm talking five, six open bites without TADS, you know, uh, really big ones. So when I see TAD attack, I just go, I think it's a bit unnecessary. I don't think this is really needed. Cool and impressive, but I, I personally don't, I think we overuse TAD in orthodontics. All right, so this is the patient now on monthly retainer checks. You can see the dots there. So every month she's uploading her photographs and dental monitoring in the background is collecting data and actually telling me, hey, none of the teeth have moved based on your scan at finish. Or if any tooth moves, dental monitoring will alert me. Um, we will also take photographs with the retainers on and photographs without the retainers. So all of these collectively every month are giving me a lot of information on how it's going. So this is the patient that we finished the treatment for. Um, I was very pleased because using a liner and virtual orthodontics, I was able to suit her lifestyle. I was monitoring from overseas and we were monitoring her gingival health and, 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 and everything that goes with it. Let's look at another case, open bite case. Um, I just see how I'll go for time. I'm just going to pause here. Um, so Tala, I'm just going to answer some questions before I go to the next one. Thank you for your lecture and extraction cases. What is the size of elast elastics as well as their frequency? Very good question. Generally, um, with aligners, I go for heavier elastics. But when fixed appliances, I go for lighter elastics. So I believe with the liners, and this is not scientifically uh, published anywhere, but with the liners, you have this like binding of the arch because the plastic is connecting the entire arch as a group. So I tend to go heavy. So medium or heavy, the ones I love is Rob, Rabbit from Omco. They're, they're medium and heavy. They're medium heavy. And I one of the key things, I ask my patients to change elastics every three or four hours because they do have a forced decay. And I actually want them all the time, like continuous forces. So it's really important that um, they, you do heavy. I know that uh, Dr. Luis Barbero as well, he likes doing heavier elastics. He actually does even heavier than me at the start. Um, I think um, some of his cases he's shown he's using Impala from Omco. But I, I love rabbits. Um, they're like a nice medium. Okay. So one of the question on status is TADS could have been a major assistance for the lower distalization buccal cortical plate TADS. You can, sorry, I can't read that. You can intrude the posterior and distalize at the same time. Thank you, status. Yeah, look, I'm sure there are 10 ways of doing things. I don't have anything against TADS, but I can get results really good without TADS. So if I really look at the, the whole thing, you know, I've done a lot of cases without pads and, and I just go, firstly, when patient is in between overseas, it's very difficult to put TADS in and let them go. But, um, you know, I, I do believe TADS have a very strong role in uh, posterior mesialization. Very, very good for that. For molar uprighting, very good for that. Um, any type of really extrusive activity, right? When you're really extruding or preserving the arch form, when you wanna avoid side effects uh, for um, the, the, the uh, anchor teeth. So I, I have nothing against that. There are certain cases where I'm just doing intrusion of a upper molar so that we have implant space for in the lower arch and TADs are perfect for that. So when it's a single isolated movement like that, but when I have an arch form and I'm doing, you know, look, it depends. This is my way of doing things. You can go ahead and use TADs every day. I'm not saying they're bad. I have, I use them much more limited um, than I've seen some of the other practitioners. Okay, so this is an open bite case. And um, again, a case that didn't want surgery. Uh, obviously a little bit of gingival display on smiling here. And uh, we decided to just treat him with good old intrusion, extrusion mechanics, you know, open bite control, some anterior IPR, mild class three elastics as well with the lower IPR, extrusion 
of anteriors. Um, and, you know, patients know that this tends to be not stable long term. To be honest, whether you do it with TADS or not, open bites, we know, have a lower stability. Um, TADS don't improve stability. So um, this is him, you know, closure happening at 11 months. You can see the class three getting a bit worse. You can see he's, he's almost edge to edge. So we go back in and do a bit more IPR. We add some attachments. We can see like, for example, tooth lower incisor. We built only 0.3 millimeter extrusion, but it had a tracking failure there. So we decide, you can see the 231 here, it's got a tracking failure. So we decided to go back and add more attachments on all these teeth. And then we did more IPR, class three elastics. And um, you can see, we just redid the anterior attachments. I like conventional attachments. I, I'm not a big fan of beveled attachments. So everything I do, I try to do conventional. A recent study actually came out. I'm uh, sorry, I can't remember what one it was, but it showed that the larger the lever, the bigger the lever, the bigger the conventional attachment, the more moment um, of force was controlled and generated. So um, the more force, sorry, was generated and less rotational. Uh, moment of force. So I really do like my big conventional attachments. Um, and a lot of times I remove optimized. All the optimized and beveled, I'll remove them and I'll go straight away conventional. So we get to this time point, this patient's on monitoring and we get to a 14 month progress. We've now got open bite closure. Again, we've created gingival symmetry. We, we can do crown lengthening for him. And we're almost, I think we do a final revision. We remove all attachments now. Sometimes at the end, I'll just do some settling aligners with no attachments, some bit more IPR to help retract those incisors a bit more. And we get to the end here. So this is him. This is the patient. He came and said, thank you to me. Um, we were at a party and when he came. And so he's an engaged patient. Um, he was very compliant. We were able to troubleshoot problems early and it was a great learning platform for me. Final case, this is a, a case of severe crowding and transposition. We have um, a, a, your upper right deciduous canine present there while the upper right permanent canine is transposed in between the central and the lateral incisor. So we've got an upper arch canine transposition, severe crowding in the lower arch, short frenum, bimax protrusive, severe crowding. This is his CEF at the start. Unfortunately, he was, I think he was biting edge to edge. But what you can see here in the CBCT image is where the canine is, where the lateral incisor is, there's a deciduous canine present as well. And and so we've got a little bit messed up situation here. Um, he's, you know, an adult. He's about 22, 23, young adult. And uh, this is a CBCT just showing you the all the different routes. And um, you see the deciduous tooth still there, lateral incisor there. So we've got an upper canine transposition. This is on day one, we take a video with the virtual monitoring app. And you can see that. Um, is crowding and is overbind. So we design a clean check. Obviously, this is an extraction case. Straight away, I'm seeing extractions here um, due to the severe nature of the crowding, the transposition. He also had a lot of gingival recession on the upper premolars, actually. So we extract all his first premolars and we are obviously distalizing anteriors. He's bimax protrusive. We have to move the canine out of the way before the lateral incisor can come forward and derotate. And we've got to correct the class two canine relationship as well. So we use mild class two elastics. He wasn't a class two skeletal to begin with. So we did very light, short phase class two elastics, not for too long. I think you'll see it better from the side. So we extract the deciduous canine we are uh, retracting that permanent canine and blue is where the teeth were, white is where they're going to. So it's going into the space of the premolar. 
and you can see this incredible amount of movement for that canine, not only the crown, but the root. And then we have incredible amount of movement for the lateral incisor, upper lateral, which is rotating and then coming forward. Um, and I must say, look, I'm not saying I'm, uh, uh, I'm proud to not use TAD. I didn't use TADs in this, you know. So a lot of times I say to my patients, I might use TADs here, but I end up not using it because as I see them go so well, and it makes me think, what is it? Is it my patients that are more compliant or is it because they're using virtual monitoring, you know, or they're very compliant on virtual monitoring. Hence, we have every aligner. If you can imagine, the patient doesn't change the aligner till the first one fits perfectly. You're more likely to get those movements. Okay, so let's look at it from this side. We've got a class one molar on this side. We've extracted the upper premolars and we are retracting the canines and anteriors. Plastic is very good at anterior retraction. It's very good at intrusion. It's a pushing force. So when I know I'm retracting incisors into an extraction space, I don't need TADs, okay? So let's look at this again. This is the occlusal. We've got pontics there. The fours are gone. Upper, upper first premolars are gone. We are now distalizing that canine, upper right canine. As we're distalizing it, we're pushing the central or the lateral incisor forward and an attachment will come on that, I think, at some point. And we're moving it forwards. So incredible amount of root movement for a 22 or 23-year-old. Um, and there's not a lot of posterior distalization or movement because he's almost class one molar. Both sides were class one. So a lot of the movement's happening anterior. And severe crowding here, but because we extracted the first premolars, again, we distalize the anteriors and then we bring that displaced lateral incisor labially forwards. So it's phasic movements and again, using virtual monitoring. So this is him 21 months in treatment, guys. So 21 months is a long time, but remember this is a transposition case with severe crowding. And um, and we do know aligners in extraction cases do take a bit longer. He didn't finish here it, because we wanted to get, now he was happy to finish. I didn't want to finish because the upper right canine needs incredible amount of distal root tip. It is not yet at the position I want it to be. So the patient was very compliant. And I said, is it okay if we keep going? I wanna get the canine in a better position for you. So from, from uh, 21 months to nearly, I think it was three years or something, three, three and a half years, we come here to the finish line. The patient was truly happy. He was uh, joyed. We get a beautiful canine, um, the, not only distalization, but also tipping of the root. Uh, and I mean, this took time. This took a lot of time, right? Plenty of refinements. This is a severe case. I think we would have done five or six refinements here. Uh, each time we changed a few attachments. Uh, we used very little elastics at the end because elastics had no point. It was class one. It was all about slowing down the aligner. So every thing that was programmed in each aligner was delivered. So this is what I believe dental monitoring does. Um, and this is the initial, the before and after. So we maintain the class one. Now, obviously a mild posterior open bite is a hallmark of aligners. We expect settling and retention. Um, this patient can now go get crown lengthening because his upper left canine, the, the gingiva is quite low. So, or, and the upper right canine, the gingival heights are uneven. So patient can go get some crown lengthening and uh, we expect this to settle. He'll be in retention. This is his post-treatment, Ceph and OPG. He's now getting his third molars extracted and uh, you can see quite nice. You can look at the upper left canine, upper right canine now. You can see a nice straight root. We were very tipped before. So nice straight root and uh, very, very pleased. I mean, you can imagine how pleased this patient would be all with the liners and elastics. 
we do see a slight retraction in his profile. I think it's come back a little bit, not massive, but with the extraction, we have kind of balanced it a little bit more. Uh, his skin is better now, isn't it? His skin was worse before. His skin is nice and smooth. Um, and he's more confident in smiling. So you can see, you know, it was a challenging case, but we maintained the smile display and, um, you know, his overbite control was pretty good. So I was very pleased with that one. We're writing a case report on that case and taking it to a journal because I think that's a, it's a beautiful case with no skeletal anchorage, okay? Um, with a lot of tipping and a lot of things. So uh, I'll just pause here. Status is asking, what kind of virtual monitoring are you using? Um, I use dental monitoring, but there's also Invisalign, I think has its own. Um, I, I use dental monitoring. I haven't used Invisalign, but my friends have and my colleagues have, and they tell me the Invisalign is a bit, it's not bad actually, because it's free. Um, and it's pretty good but it doesn't have AI. So it doesn't make decisions for you like dental monitoring. Um, it's just, dental monitoring is just very sophisticated. It's like asking me Invisalign and clear correct, right? Invisalign was market leader and Invisalign came as a market leader and clear correct will always be the second. So dental monitoring is a market leader, but you don't have to use it. I, I know this, and, and maybe in Europe you have other apps, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm just showing you my system. So I think if you want to transition to aligners with virtual tracking, I think it's about getting the right amount of education, mentoring, you know, getting your team ready because it's and changing to a system always takes time. And, uh, you know, growing with that system, I always, I remember when I first used dental monitoring, it took me six months to adapt. Um, I will just want to leave you with some basics. We should all remember, um, you know, Professor uh, Prophet was actually, he came to Adelaide University when I was a resident and I was so happy. He's a legend, right? This is, you know, where he's lecturing us right there and we're sitting there at our university. We were so happy. I just couldn't help myself. I took this photograph. I think I was second year in my residency and um, I always remember the most bad, the best thing he's given us in orthodontic is his envelope of discrepancy. And I never forget it because so many times people ask this basic question, can you really move teeth this much? How, how much can you move? And I always go, remember profits envelope discrepancy. We know how much orthodontics can do. We know how much orthodontic and orthopedics can do. We know skeletal anchorage expands the envelope a little bit. And then we have surgery. So we know this for central incisor, lower incisor, and upper molar. He gave us, you know, those limits of tooth movement. So obviously, skeletal anchorage does have a role. And for example, if I were to distalize an upper molar more than four millimeter, I think we need skeletal anchorage. We need to extract the eights as well. But a lot of times, you know, my treatments would involve up to four millimeters. So skeletal anchorage has a role for sure, but mostly in those cases where you cannot do it with orthodontics or orthopedic alone. Um, I also run a diploma. I'm a course director for an Australian accredited diploma. This is mostly geared for general dentists. I have an Australian accredited college in Australia. It's online. It's called Digital Orthodontic College. From short courses to diploma programs, we teach all about aligners, virtual monitoring, how to do good clean checks. Um, and if you want to pursue any further education, you can contact me. But I know a lot of you are orthodontist. I've graduated many people across Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, they all have got the, the boss diploma and uh, doing fantastic work. I'm a believer of doing excellent work in your everyday orthodontics. Um, I teach a, a, a level of excellence to these dentists and I'm very proud of the results they achieve. Um, if you want to go to the Boss YouTube channel, it's at Boss Ortho or at Instagram. It's full of videos uh, from clinical tips to um, cases, coaching, and, um, you know, taking records, doing clean checks. So you can have a, a you know, play at some of the videos. Um, 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for Smart Aligner Services and Dr. Barbera for inviting me. And um, I, I really appreciate, you know, talking to you all. I'm happy to take questions. And while I take questions, I'm just going to also go back to the slide where I will put up the QR code in case you want to download the handout for this lecture, as well as the publications I've uh, I've put up there. So um, guys, I'm ready for questions if you have any. Do you have any questions? Mm, no, no questions, that sounds amazing. So, Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'd love some feedback. Can somebody tell me what, um, sorry, can you share the link? Um, I'm not sure what link you mean, um, qrcode.de forward slash pubs. Um, it's here. So this is a QR code. You can scan that. Um, you can scan this QR code with your phone. Oh, you can't scan it. Okay, so the link is on the top. Uh, you can even go www.qrco.de forward slash pubs, right? So I think, oh, HTTPS. So that link will also work. I'm sorry, I'll double check the QR code if it's not working. Um, uh, so yeah, guys, so... If no questions, any feedback? I mean, was there something that you learned today? I'd love to know what you learned today. Thank you. Thank you, Kandan. Was there something that I gave you that will help you transition or change your, your way of practice? <laughs> oh, hi, Emma. You're from States. Okay. Yeah, hope to see you there too. Um, yeah, so if anything that you think of, guys, you can message me through our website down there, digitalorthodonticcollege.edu.au. Okay, so I'll just type that here in the chat, digitalorthodonticcollege.edu.au. Um, I'll also put my personal email here, vendana at digitalorthodontics. I'm sorry, I didn't put it there, college.com. So my email is vendana at digitalorthodonticcollege.com. And I put that in the chat. If you have any questions, once you download the handout and all the different publications, if you have any questions, feel free to message me, email me, and I'd be happy to help. I'm also on Insta, uh, Instagram, follow us at Boss Ortho, um, where I post regularly cases, papers, uh, fun stuff. So guys, can I just know what, what is the one thing that you learned before you go? Is there something here that, that sticks in your brain? Yeah, sure, Emma, thank you. <laughs> is there anything that you want to say to me here? Yeah, no? Okay, guys, look, thank you so much for watching. You've been great. Thank you for your questions. And uh, I hope I, you know, one day you guys lecture and I look forward to learning from you as well. So thank you very much. So just remember email vendana at digitalorthodonticcollege.com or you can contact me through Instagram as well at Boss Ortho um, and or um, via our website, digitalorthodonticcollege.edu.au. Are you 100% sold to aligners? Can do all bodily movements. I actually am a very good question. I don't believe aligners do very good molar uprighting or molar or posterior mesialization. That's very bad with aligners. Um, extrusion, not so bad. We can get good extrusion with it um, if we compensate. But posterior mesialization and uh, molar uprighting tend to, I, I tend to use more skeletal anchorage for that. In which situation do you use TADS? Yeah, so mostly molar uprighting. I don't want, it's, it's wasting time with the liners. I've seen molars uprighted with the liners. I've done it, but it could take me two years. With TADS and partial fixed appliances, I can get there faster. 
Um, also molar mesialization, when I want to preserve my anterior anchorage, I don't want to retract my incisors. That is a great, and, and, and plastic aligners are not good at molar mesialization. So I find the tads are just fantastic for that. Um, how about extraction cases? You don't believe we can close spaces 100%. Well, um, I mean, I showed you two extraction cases. So uh, I know there's only two, but they were quite severe. And I believe actually anterior retraction, beautiful with the liners, um, great finishing, but uh, but you burn the patient with the liners. Um, you mean in terms of treatment time? Um, I think treatment time, yes, it's longer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. You need a very compliant patient to do aligners and extraction and very motivated. And they must want aligners. If they, because I will always say to them, fix appliances. I want to treat you with fixed. But if they, you know, look, in my, in, in Sydney, I practice with 95% um, aligner cases in my practice. So people come to me for aligners. People come to me wanting aligners. So I have a very unique practice. They don't come to me for fixed appliances. So a lot of my patients are coming to me because others have said you can't be done with it. So I do it and I tell them this is going to be long road. So in gummy small cases, do you use TAD for intrusion? If yes, which area do you insert them? In gummy small cases, to be honest, I find that if I can do crown lengthening, that's amazing. If I can't, I have not. I must say I don't intrude because generally gummy smiles, you're, if you've got an open bite, right? If you've got an open bite, you're extruding. So I don't see how I would intrude anteriors. I would intrude posteriors, but no, I haven't used it. You know, I can show you cases of crazy open bites that I've done without TADS. Um, and the studies show us that majority of open bite with aligners do not close because of TADS. They close because of anterior retraction and IPR. Majority of open bite closures with aligners is anterior retraction and that space coming from IPR to retract them. Uh, IPR is interproximal reduction. So there's actually two studies that showed that. And um, one of them is from Kenji Ojima's practice. And the other one, I don't know, sorry, I don't know the author, but I know that they're both showing the same thing. And, and so I do a lot of my, you know, it's look, it's all about diagnosis. There are definitely those cases where you have to use TADS, but my brain doesn't go to TAD first ever, ever. My brain goes to how can I avoid TADS here? How can I deliver efficient, good, predictable orthodontics by using my basic principles, doing a good job, great, get, getting great anchorage control, right? A lot of these cases you saw, there was great anchorage control, getting good anchorage control, good case selection. But yes, there are cases where I will use TADS. So I'm sorry I don't show you a TAD attack, but I work differently. So this is my way of showing you there's a different way. Okay, so as I said, in your practices, you can do as many TADs as you want, but I think they're an overkill. Um, TADs don't make your teeth move faster, osteoclasts do. TADs simply preserve anchorage. They don't give you better tooth movement, they simply preserve anchorage. Um, all right, guys, I'll leave you with this. So thank you for the interesting questions. Uh, thank you, Diana. And um, yeah, lovely meeting you all. And I hope to see you all one day. If you're in Sydney, call me, message me. And I look forward to meeting you. Bye from Sydney. It's midnight now. It's actually almost midnight here, guys. So enjoy your lunch in Spain and your siesta. And I hope you have a lovely time. Bye.